ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so we now on the chapter from kitab at-tawhid bab ma jaa fi man lam yaqna' bil halif billah the chapter regarding the one who is not convinced by an oath taken by Allah so this chapter is regarding taking the oaths the first narration in this chapter is the narration of Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma anna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qaal that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la tahlifu bi abaikum man halafa billah falyasduq wa man hulifa lahu billah falyarda wa man lam yarda falaysa min Allah This narration from Ibn Umar, Abdullah Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, he says that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do not take oaths in the names of your fathers. Do not say, I swear by my father, or as people say, I swear on my father's life. Do not make these types of oaths. لا تحلفوا بآبائكم The prohibition of doing that, we already mentioned it in a previous chapter, that it is impermissible for you to take oaths by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The narrations had mentioned, من حلف بغير الله فقد كفر أو أشرك Whoever takes an oath by other than Allah, then he has committed kufr or shirk. لِأَنَّ الْحَلِفِ تَعْظِيمٌ لِلْمَحْلُوفِ بِهِ وَمَنْ عَظَّمَ غَيْرَ اللَّهِ بِالْحَلِفِ بِهِ فَإِنَّ هَذَا شِرْكٌ بِاللَّهِ Because when you take an oath, the oath when it is taken by something, that is a veneration of that thing. It is a great respect and honor for that thing. So when people come along and they say, I swear on my mother's life that I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Why do they say on my mother's life, on my father's life, on my children's lives? Why do they say those statements in their oaths? Because it indicates a great deal of importance that how could I possibly lie to you if I'm swearing on my children's lives, how could I possibly be lying if I'm swearing on my mother's life? It indicates a great importance and honor and respect for the mother's life, for the children's lives. That's why they take an oath on those things, because people will then be convinced, surely his mother, his children, he wouldn't lie upon them. So when you take an oath, it indicates the greatness of who you are taking the oath upon. And that's why it is impermissible to do it by anyone else besides Allah. Because Allah is the one whom you should be indicating the greatness of. Indicating the greatness and the might and the majesty of Allah alone. So your oath should be made in the name of Allah alone. That I swear by Allah, such and such, such and such. Not I swear on my mother's life, on my father's life, on my children's lives. That would be a form of shirk. Because you are now making the lives of your parents or your children in a very high and grand and honorable and noble station such that you are raising them and magnifying them by taking an oath upon them. And that type of magnification and greatness is only for Allah. So as humans, as creation, we cannot take oaths by anyone besides Allah. If you take an oath, مَنْ كَانَ حَالِفًا فَلْيَحْلِفْ بِاللَّهِ 
then only take an oath by Allah. If a person said that this narration says, لا تحلفوا بآبائكم Do not take the oaths upon your father's names. That if you do it on your mother's name, it's okay therefore. Because the narration only says, don't do it upon your father's name. That is incorrect. It also means mother's name. This doesn't just mean specifically to fathers. When the narration says, لا تحلفوا بآبائكم Do not take the oaths upon your fathers. It doesn't specifically mean fathers. Fathers, mothers, children, everything. It is all included in that. The point here is, do not take an oath by anyone else besides Allah. Anyone in creation. Your fathers, your mothers, even upon the prophets and the messengers, you do not take oaths upon others besides Allah. Even the Kaaba, you hear some people saying, I swear by the Kaaba. Again, these types of statements are not correct. You swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do not take these oaths for others besides Allah. Then the narration says, وَمَنْ حَلِفَ بِاللَّهِ فَلْيَسْدُقْ That whoever takes an oath by Allah, then be truthful. Be honest and be truthful. Do not lie taking an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed that would be a great sin, a great sin that you swear, take an oath in the name of Allah and then lie. So the narration says, whomsoever takes an oath by Allah, swears by Allah, then be honest and be truthful and do not be dishonest and lying. هذا أمر من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن الحالف بالله يجب عليه أن يصدق فلا يحلف بالله كاذبا This is a command from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that whoever takes an oath by Allah then let him be truthful and not to take an oath by Allah and lie لأن من حلف بالله وهو كاذب فَقَدْ اسْتَهَانَ بِعَظَمَةِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَ Because a person who swears in the name of Allah, but then lies, he has belittled Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a belittlement of the greatness of Allah. It is a belittlement of the greatness of Allah, that you don't think it's important, and you don't think it matters. Swearing by Allah, but then lying like you don't care. Like you don't think it has any importance, any severity, any sin. Swearing by Allah and lying shows that you do not have that greatness for Allah in your heart. So a person, if he takes an oath by Allah but then lies, shows how he is degrading his respect and his honor for Allah and the might and the majesty of Allah. And that is something clearly incorrect. And if a person was to take the right of another individual on top, for example, he swore by Allah, and then after swearing by Allah, he takes the right of a person, he says, lying in his oath that this money belongs to me, or this property belongs to me. So he lies in an oath he takes by Allah, that in of itself is a great sin. But then on top of that, he takes the property from the other individual wrongfully, Due to this lie of his, then that is another great sin on top of the first sin. So these are great evils and a person needs to be aware of the danger of taking an oath and lying. Taking an oath and swearing by Allah, but then lying. What a great sin that is. And it's mentioned that the person who lies when he takes an oath, that that is known as al-yameen al-ghamus, because that will throw the person who does that into the fire or into sin. You are thrown into sin, you are casting yourself into sin by taking oaths and swearing by Allah, but then lying. Allah said in the Qur'an, فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ 
that we will make the curse of Allah upon the liars. The curse of Allah upon the liars. And what is the curse of Allah? The curse of Allah, the la'na, is that you are distanced, taken away from the mercy of Allah. You are distanced and sent away from the mercy of Allah. And how terrible that is, a person who does not have the mercy of Allah, he is distanced from the mercy of Allah. So here it is mentioned, فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ will make the la'na, the curse of Allah, upon the liars. Also, Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, إِنَّمَا يَفْتَرِ الْكَذِبَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ Indeed, the ones who fabricate lies are the ones who do not have iman in the ayat of Allah. They are the liars. The ones who fabricate lies, then they are the ones who do not have iman in the ayat of Allah. And they are the disbelievers. So this is a great affair. The affair of truthfulness. And to avoid the lying and the false speech. It is mentioned in a hadith, ثَلَاثَةٌ لَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Three types of people Allah will not speak to them on the day of judgment. Three types of people Allah will not speak to them on the day of judgment. لا يكلمهم الله يوم القيامة ولا ينظر إليهم and Allah will not look at them ولا يزكيهم and Allah will not purify them ولهم عذاب أليم and they have a great punishment. Who are they? المسبل والمنان وَالْمُنْفِقْ صَلْعَتَهُ بِالْيَمِينِ الْكَذِبَةِ Three people whom Allah will not speak to on the day of judgment, and will not look at, and will not purify. The first, المُسْبِل The man who wears his clothing below his ankles. The man who wears his clothing below his ankles. As for the women, it is permissible. And in fact, not just permissible, but required that their garments are lengthy and they cover them completely. But the men who wear their garments below their ankles, whether it is with pride or without pride, then there is a punishment upon them. Here it is mentioned, the musbil, the one who wears his garments below his ankles, then Allah will not speak to him on the day of judgment and will not look at him and will not purify him. Similarly, Al-Mannan, the one who praises himself and belittles others when he gives them something. Reminds them, remember I gave you that. Remember it was me who helped you out with that. The one who behaves in that type of way, then this is a Mannan, who impresses with himself in what he gives to others impresses upon himself with that, and impresses himself upon others, I gave you this and I gave you that. These types of behaviors are from the evil behaviors. And similarly, the third one, المنفقو سلعته باليمين الكاذبة The one who sells his goods with an oath that he takes as a lie. He says, by Allah, this item it is worth such and such. So he sells it for a high price, and in reality it is not worth that amount. He took an oath, and he was swearing by Allah that it's worth this and it's worth that, to sell it for a high price, and in reality it was not worth that price at all. So that individual is also from these whom Allah will not speak to, nor look at, nor purify on the day of judgment. This all highlights to you how important it is to be truthful. And that is from the behavior of a Muslim to be truthful. As for the one who is not truthful, then he has in him a characteristic from the characteristics of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned regarding the hypocrites, Ayatul munafiq thalath. The sign of a hypocrite is three things. One of them 
إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذِبْ When he speaks, he lies. When he speaks, he lies. When he speaks, he lies. And that's why the scholars, they said, this tongue of yours, the tongue that you have been given, it is a blessing from the blessings of Allah. So do not abuse this blessing. Do not abuse this blessing you have been given by lying with it. The scholars, they say, that this tongue of yours, it has been created in a manner where you have two lines of defense for it. Two lines of defense. You have your teeth in front of your tongue. And you have your lips in front of your teeth. Before your tongue can come out and speak, it must get past your teeth and it must get past your lips. The scholars, they say, control your tongue with your teeth and your lips. Do not let your tongue come out beyond your teeth and the lips to lie, to backbite, to slander, to speak evil. Control it and keep it locked behind the teeth and the lips and do not let it come out to speak evil. Because all of those words and speech of evil that you make, then it will be recorded against you. In the hadith it mentions, وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيَتَكَلَّمُ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِنْ سَخَطِ اللَّهِ لَا يُلْقِ لَهَا بَالًا يَهْوِي بِهَا إِلَى جَهَنَّمُ A person may say a small word, something that he doesn't even pay attention to, but it's something evil, which is from the anger of Allah, from the displeasure of Allah. Some small thing that he says, from the anger and displeasure of Allah, not something good. But he doesn't even pay attention to it, it's so minor he thinks. But it will be recorded, and that small thing that he said, which was from the displeasure of Allah, from the anger of Allah, could be the cause, the reason, for him being cast into the hellfire, thrown into the hellfire upon that one word. And that's why when the people are given their books on that day, when they are given their scrolls, their books with all of their deeds in them, they will say that how come this book, it doesn't miss anything from the large or even the tiny affairs. Nothing is missed. Everything is here in this book recorded and written. So here the hadith it mentions regarding the truthfulness, particularly if you are swearing by Allah, you are taking an oath by Allah and you're going to lie, then this is something severe and this is something of great importance that a person realizes being truthful and not being from the characteristics of the hypocrites in lying and speaking evil with your tongue. In another narration it is mentioned how one of the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ, will the people be thrown into the fire because of the tongues? So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and for what else? Certainly the tongue is a great cause of evil. As Shaykh Al-Fawzan said, a person may be doing so much worship, he does so much obedience, so much good actions, but your tongue can destroy all of those actions in a split moment. All of that worship you've been doing can be destroyed in a split moment with your tongue. In the hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, أَتَدْرُونَ مَنِ الْمُفْلِسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Do you know who the bankrupt one is on the day of judgment? قَالُوا مَنْ لَا دِرْهَمَ وَلَا دِينَارَ لَهُ the one who doesn't have any gold and silver, no money. But the Prophet ﷺ said to them, لَيْسَ كَمَا تَذُنُّونَ It is not what you think. It is not what you think. The bankrupt one on the day of judgment is not the one who has no money. The bankrupt one on the day of judgment will be a person who used to do lots of worship. He used to do lots of worship, prayer, salah, zakah, sawm. He used to do the worship. But at the same time, he used to lie about this one and slander that one and backbite this one and hit this one and abuse that one. And because of those actions of his, whether it be from his tongue in lying and slandering about others, 
or his physical actions, they destroy his deeds. Because those whom he oppressed, they will come one by one, wanting their rights back from him. So he will have to start giving them his good deeds. And until all of his good deeds, they finish and they run out, and there are still people waiting to get their rights back, then they will take their evil deeds and throw them unto him. Such is the bankrupt one on the day of judgment. So this hadith he mentions, to be truthful, and when taking an oath by Allah, swearing by Allah, then of course, certainly to be truthful. Then the narration says, وَمَنْ حُلِفَ لَهُ بِاللَّهِ فَالْيَرْضَى If somebody swears by Allah, takes an oath by Allah, then be satisfied with it. Be content with what he tells you if he takes an oath by Allah. Because taking an oath by Allah is a great affair. It is not something minor. Somebody takes an oath by Allah upon such and such, then take his word for it and be pleased and content and satisfied with what he mentions. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَرْضَى فَلَيْسَ مِنَ اللَّهِ And the one who does not accept the statement of an individual who has taken an oath by Allah, then here it mentions the innocence of Allah from that individual who does not accept and be convinced by an oath in the name of Allah. The scholars they mention that it is therefore obligatory to be satisfied and convinced if an oath by Allah is taken by someone. Somebody swears by Allah X, Y, and Z, then you should accept that and be content with that and acknowledge that. And it is impermissible to not be convinced by it and to not accept it. Because the one who takes the oath by Allah, it is a great affair that he is taking. A great affair, taking an oath in the name of Allah. Some of the scholars have mentioned that the only exception to that would be if somebody is known to be a liar. Known liar, known deceiver, somebody who is known that he swears by Allah and he still lies. Then you would not instantly give over whatever the person is requesting. Somebody may come and take an oath by Allah, swearing by Allah, requesting something from you. Typically you should accept that, and be convinced by that, and give it to him what he requires. Unless it is somebody known to be a liar, even upon taking an oath by Allah, in that case the affair can be looked at and examined. So that chapter is talking about the great importance of the oaths by Allah and swearing by Allah, and being truthful in that. And it's a mistake what you see the people doing all the time, swearing by Allah in everything, all the time, saying by Allah this, by Allah that. And half of the time they do not even know what they are actually saying, whether it is something completely authentic or not. So do not make a habit of that, but the one who does so, then it is a glorification of Allah. So be upright and truthful in your statement and be fearful of the punishment of Allah for the one who lies even after swearing upon Allah. The next chapter is Bab Qawli Ma Sha Allah Wa Shi'ta The chapter regarding the statement Whatever Allah wills and what you will Whatever Allah wills and what you will. It's mentioned here in Qutayla, أن يهوديا أتى للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال إنكم تشركون تقولون ما شاء الله وشئت وتقولون والكعبة. In this hadith, Qutayla, Qutayla. The daughter of Saifi al Ansariya, وبعضهم يقول الجهنية. She narrates, Qutayla narrates that a Jew came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
A Jew came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "You people commit shirk." A Jew came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "You people, your people, the Muslims, you commit shirk." Why? Because the Jew then said, "You people, i.e., the Muslims, you say whatever Allah wills and what you will." They say, the Muslims say, "Whatever Allah wills and whatever you will, O Prophet." So this Jew came making this point that the Muslims they say whatever Allah wills and whatever you will, that they are putting you in comparison to Allah. So you are upon shirk, the Muslims. And also, the Jew said, "You people, the Muslims, you say well Kaaba, swear by the Kaaba, taking oaths upon the Kaaba, that is shirk too." So the Jew came saying. So the Prophet ﷺ, the Muslims, you do this, saying whatever Allah wills and what you will, as if you are comparable to Allah, and by the Kaaba, swearing by the Kaaba. So this Jew knew the affair of shirk, knew the affair of shirk, knew that these statements like this are statements of shirk, and the Prophet ﷺ acknowledged it, agreed, yes. Those types of statements are shirk if somebody says them. Whatever Allah wills and whatever the Prophet Muhammad wills, and I swear by the Kaaba, those types of statements are shirk. The Prophet ﷺ acknowledged that. He acknowledged that, and then he commanded his ummah to. Alter their statements and ensure that they do not make these statements of shirk. فأمرهم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم commanded them, إذا أرادوا أن يحلفوا أن يقولوا ورب الكعبة. That if they want to make an oath, they should say, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, not by the Kaaba, by the Lord of the Kaaba, by Allah. وَأَنْ يَقُولُوا And that they should say, مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ شِئْتَ Whatever Allah wills, then after that what you will. Not whatever Allah wills and you will alongside. Whatever Allah wills, then what you will. And that's why you see it's a mistake. It's an error when you go into some mosques and they say, يَا Allah, And next to it at the same line, يَا Muhammad, As if they are the same. Muhammad sallallahu is not Allah. Muhammad sallallahu said, "Do not raise me like they raised Isa alayhi salam. La tutruni kama atrat al-Nasara Isa ibn Maryam. Don't pick me up, raise me up like the Christians did Isa alayhi salam. They began to say Isa alayhi salam is Allah as well. So it's wrong when you say Ya Allah, Ya Muhammad, all the same. Muhammad sallallahu is not uluhiya in him. So here the Prophet ﷺ said, don't say whatever Allah wills and what Muhammad ﷺ wills. Say what Allah wills, then after that what you will and you will. But not what Allah wills and what you will at the same time. Then in another narration, from Ibn Abbas, رضي الله عنهما, أن رجلا قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما شاء الله وشئت وتب الله سبحانه وتعالى wills and what you will وتب الله سبحانه وتعالى wills and what you will when a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said that to him, what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say to him? Aja'altani lillahi niddan. Are you making me a partner to Allah, saying whatever Allah wills and what you will at the same time? Are you making me a partner to Allah? Are you making me an equal to Allah? أَجَعَلْتَنِي لِلَّهِ نِدًّا بَلْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ Rather, what you have to say is what Allah wills alone. مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ Not مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَشِئْتَ 
whatever Allah wills and you will, rather what Allah wills alone. So in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed, informed the ummah how to behave and what to say and how their words should be so that they do not say words of shirk. So he informed us that what you need to say is whatever Allah wills, then whatever you will. Just as Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ You do not will any affair until Allah wills first. The will of Allah, then your will. Not that your will is comparable or equal. Your will comes afterwards, after the will of Allah. And Allah knows all of the decree. So the Prophet ﷺ informed us to avoid and stay away from this type of shirk that we may say by accident. Somebody may say it without thinking. To avoid these words. So what do we learn from these narrations? Firstly, that a person may have understanding of an affair if he is following his desires. The Jewish person here, he understood and he knew that these statements that were being made were statements of shirk. But why did he come and tell the Prophet ﷺ about that? For genuine, sincere advice? Or because he wanted to belittle the ummah? Because he wanted to belittle the ummah. Look at you people, you commit shirk. They say, I swear by the Kaaba. They say whatever Allah wills and you will. Your people, they commit shirk. He came to belittle. So look at how a person suddenly has understanding. Understands when they want to come and belittle. So this was an example where this person understood. He knew that this was shirk. And he came to belittle. Secondly, the truth is accepted whoever it comes from. The Prophet ﷺ acknowledged that is the truth. It is the truth. You're not supposed to say, I swear by the Kaaba. You're not supposed to say whatever Allah wills and you will. So the Prophet ﷺ informed his ummah to avoid that. Because the Jewish person here, he did speak the truth. He spoke the truth. What he was saying, even though he wanted to belittle, it was the truth. So the truth is accepted. This does not mean, because people misunderstand, doesn't mean therefore, you go and sit with anybody and anyone and go to any lecturer and listen to anything and say, but the truth is accepted from everyone. So these lecturers are going to have some truth obviously in their lecture. So why don't we go? The truth is accepted from everyone. Because you need to understand the religion altogether in context together. And there are many narrations of the Sahaba, of the Salaf, telling you that you do not go to the people of deviation. Just because the truth is accepted from wherever it comes from, doesn't mean you have the ability to distinguish for a start. How are you going to go sit there and distinguish what parts this lecturer is saying are true and what parts are not? The lecturer could be sat there quoting all types of hadith and making all types of points from those hadith. How would you know which of these hadith are authentic and which ones are not? He could be quoting all types of ayat of the Qur'an. And giving tafsir of these ayat. How do you know if that tafsir is correct or if it is not correct? How do you know? You may have people coming along now, making all types of tafsir. All types of ridiculous things. And they claim that they are giving tafsir of the Qur'an. Make up narrations, fabricate narrations. And they say they are giving tafsir of the Qur'an to the people. Like the individual known as Nu'man Ali Khan. This individual promotes himself, self-promoted YouTube sheikh, who now comes along and claims to be some type of mufassir, who can give tafsir of the Qur'an, and in reality, his tafsir is far, far from what the tafsir of the salaf was, and how the salaf used to give tafsir of the Qur'an, and the true understanding of this religion and the ayat of Allah. 
to the extent he even makes up fabricated a hadith that he narrates. Either he makes up or he narrates from others blindly, not having any knowledge, ends up narrating fabricated narrations. So, a person needs to be careful where you take knowledge from. Do not start saying, but the truth is taken from everyone. Yes, the truth is taken from everyone. But you, for a start, are not even in a position to be able to distinguish. It's not like you can sit in the lecture and say, I'm going to pick out all of the truthful things, and I'm going to leave all of the stuff which is wrong. How do you know which stuff is wrong? You listen to that lecture on tafsir of some individual like him, how do you know which parts he's saying are okay and which parts are not? How do you know which parts of the tafsir are correct, tafsir of the salaf, and which parts he's making up himself and taken from all types of deviant sources? How do you know? You're not going to be able to distinguish. So that's why you do not just listen to anybody and everybody. You listen to Ahlul Sunnah. You listen to the firmly grounded scholars. The scholars of Ahlul Sunnah that Allah commanded us to return to. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Ask the people of knowledge. Not the people who tell you Aqeedah has no value. Aqeedah has no importance. Like this individual who we mentioned belittles the affairs of Aqeedah and Tawheed and has strange ideas of what knowledge is and what people need to learn. Rather go to the way of the Salaf. Go to the grounded scholars. Go to the ulama, Rabbaniyun. That is where knowledge is taken from. Not from anybody who comes along and makes themselves famous on YouTube. Do not follow the YouTube sheikhs. People who are not known for knowledge. People who have never gone and studied with the scholars. But they open up a YouTube channel. And nowadays all it takes is a couple of months on YouTube. A few videos. Some comedy in there. Get a few views. And that's it. Now all of a sudden you are a sheikh. You have made yourself a sheikh. The DIY sheikhs of our time. The DIY sheikhs. All you need is a laptop and a YouTube account. So be aware of these things. Do not fall into this type of misguidance because nowadays it is open. Social media is open. Anybody can come along and start quoting hadith, start copying things from here, from there, and make themselves look like they have knowledge. Make themselves look like that they are educated. You have kids, literally almost kids, 20 years old, 21 years old, putting videos out on YouTube. And one of the most ridiculous things I heard the other day, a 21 or 22 year old claiming to have knowledge now, same DIY YouTube, Sheikh style. And on this one particular video, this 22 year old sits there giving the lecture and he says, today, my brothers and sisters, I would like to share some benefits with you that I have learned over the years. MashaAllah. 22 years old. And he's going to share with you benefits he has learned over the years. He has only just learned how to... Many things you could say he has only just learned how to do. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, you're going to share benefits what you've learned over the years. What are you going to share with us? Which benefits have you learned over the years? Over the years. Roll back just a few years, and you were barely 10 years old. Barely 12 years old. Are you going to tell us how you learned how to count? Are you going to tell us how you learned how to spell? Which benefits are you going to tell us you've learned over the years? This is the, the level of ridiculous statements you hear from these people who are amazed by themselves. Self-amazement is a great evil. Great evil from the shaitan onto a person. That a person starts thinking himself to be something. Look at this now, 21, 22 year old kids on YouTube promoting themselves as people of knowledge. Promoting themselves as individuals who should be listened to. And their YouTube lectures should be listened to. That they have knowledge at the age of 22, mashaAllah. The Salaf used to say, young kids who come in and they sit down. And they talk. When elders are in the presence of them, then do not expect anything good from these young kids. No shame for themselves, no honor for themselves. Who do they think they are? A young child who's barely learned anything and he wants to promote himself as a YouTube sheikh. So be aware of these things. The YouTube sheikhs are many these days. 
It is not a joke and it is not an exaggeration. All you need is a laptop and a YouTube account. And a few months of patience and you'll be a sheikh. That's all it takes. So be warned and be wary of this type of thing. Don't just log on to these social media channels of Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Any Tom, Dick and Harry who comes along claiming to have knowledge, claiming to be someone, sitting there giving lectures. Don't think that this person is instantly now someone to take knowledge from. The Salaf, they used to say, إِنَّ هَذَا الْعِلْمَ دِينَ إِنَّ هَذَا نَعَمْ إِنَّ هَذَا الْعِلْمَ دِينَ فَانْظُرُوا عَمَّنْ تَأْخُذُونَ دِينَكُمْ This knowledge that you are seeking, it isn't knowledge of maths or English or French. This knowledge you are seeking is knowledge of your religion. So look to who you take your religion from. Don't just take your religion from anyone. In fact, if you look at the academic subjects, if you had a son or a daughter, and you want her to have a private tutor for them, and you're going to pay 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 25 pounds an hour for a private tutor to teach your kids maths, are you going to hire any Tom, Dick and Harry off the street? You're going to look at their qualifications. You're going to look at all of their background, all of their qualifications, all of their teaching experience. Because if you're going to pay for a private tutor, and you want your kids to do really good, you want somebody qualified to come and teach. Not just some cowboy coming along saying, I'm a math tutor, give me 20 pounds an hour, and he can't teach your kids anything. You're going to look, and you're going to check, and you're going to scrutinize. So if that's what you would do for something like maths or science for your kids, then isn't religion more important than that? Isn't religion, your religion that you will be held accountable upon on the day of judgment more important? Shouldn't you be scrutinizing where you take knowledge from in terms of your religion? You scrutinize which maths tutor we're going to hire, which science tutor is the best. But when it comes to the religion, log on and listen to anybody on YouTube. Log on and listen to anybody on the websites. Read anything on any website. Follow any Twitter account randomly here and there who claim to have knowledge. Do not be like this. You will be led astray. You will be misguided. Led astray by these foolish individuals who do not have knowledge of the religion, and they promote themselves, and they misguide themselves, and they misguide others. So here, uh, the second point that was made, that the truth no doubt is taken from wherever it comes from. But that is not an excuse for a person to misunderstand that, and say, therefore, let's go and take knowledge from everyone. Thirdly, we also understand from this that the Jews even though they are upon that misguidance, they do have an understanding of Tawheed. They understood here. Some of them, they understand that. And they understand what the shirk is. Yet, they continue upon their falsehood. As for the statement, مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَشِئْتَ Then this is impermissible as we've said, because it is a form of shirk, and you have to say whatever Allah wills, then what you will. Because when that person said it, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Have you made me a partner alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have you made me an equal alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you comparing me to Allah? Do not say whatever Allah wills and what you will. Say what Allah wills, then what you will. And it's a great mistake how the people, they exaggerate about the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was the final messenger, the best of creation. But we're not going to exaggerate and say he was made out of light. Did the Prophet ﷺ tell you he's made out of light? No hadith. So we do not exaggerate. Did the Prophet ﷺ say, make dua to him, ask him for shafa'a, go to his grave? He didn't tell us to do that. Instead he told us the opposite. لا تتخذوا قبر عيدا. Do not take my grave as a place of repetitive visitation. So a person does not exaggerate with regards to the Prophet ﷺ. Rather we do upon Tawheed what we were commanded, and what the Prophet ﷺ told us himself, and not to go beyond that and beyond the bounds of what we have been taught. We'll round off on that point today. There is more to come in this chapter. We'll carry on with next week. There's another story to come yet. A story regarding how uh, more some Jews came to Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, so we'll mention that story next time, next week, inshallah, 8 p.m. So we'll conclude upon that for tonight. Uh, if there's any questions we're able to take, we'll do so. Uh, otherwise, we'll round off there. You, you know, as regards to taking oaths, mm. uh, what about uh, the Quran? Is the Quran is a speech of Allah?
So. Correct, it's okay. Because an oath by the Quran is an oath by an attribute of Allah. So that is correct. It is impermissible though to take a Quran and say, I swear by the Quran. When people do that, that is a bid'ah. That is not from the way of the Salaf. To put your hand on the Quran and say, I swear by the Quran. Putting your hand on the Quran, that is a bid'ah. You know, the, uh, some courts, they... they make you do that. So you should explain. Say, I'll, I'll take an oath, but not with my hand on the Quran and these things. Mm-hmm. Same, then that's Allah. Same. That's Allah. Rabbul Arsh is Allah. Rabbul Kaaba. Are there sisters? There are. If there are any questions from the sisters, they can send it. Is there any way to send it? Papers or anything? Or if they have any, if they have any questions, they can write them down. And send them on papers and uh, just throw them under the door or something or leave them at the door. If they allow that, that's okay. Just know that this is a bit as a scholar's mentioned, putting your hand on it. No questions from the sisters. Okay. In that case, we'll round off there then, and we'll carry on next week at 8 p.m. The lesson starts no earlier than 8 p.m. It's always 8 p.m. or afterwards. So if you arrive at 8 p.m., normally start 5 past 8, inshallah.